Imagine that the most handsome, charismatic person stares you straight in the eye and says, you're special, you look good, and you're good at what you do. He seems to know just what you like. He reads your innermost thoughts, and you feel like you've discovered a soulmate, a deep intimacy. You're experiencing one of those rare fleeting moments that makes life worth living. <laughs> Before you know it, you're involved in a deep personal bond with a psychopath. What are psychopaths? Do you know any? Personally? As recently as 2008, most people were just getting on with their lives. Their struggles, their joys, their victories, their defeat. And then, came the financial crisis. What shocked everybody is how it all happened so fast. Bang! People lost their homes, their jobs, their life savings, an entire way of life gone. The only thing we can say with certainty is that this is not the first time we've screwed up. As a matter of fact, we're getting better at it. I'm sure you've heard a lot of people say that we live in unique times, that society is in trouble, that the situation's critical. The ancient Chinese said, a fish stinks from the head. But is that true? Is the answer really so simple? Did you make the mess? I didn't. So who did? I think it makes sense to look for some explanation from the people who are in charge at least for somebody to blame. At first glance, it does appear that the world's elites, politicians, bankers, business leaders, have all, once again, completely failed in their given roles. What do we really know about people in power? We trust our lives to them, their decisions affect millions. We know that some of them, at least, are not the nicest people on the planet. Could they be psychopaths? In their book, appropriately titled Snakes in Suits, psychologists Robert Hare and Paul Babiak propose a new and provocative term, the corporate psychopath.
Psychopath means crazy. Crazy. Crazy person. <laughs> A crazy person. Crazy person. Very crazy person. Creepy people. Psychopath. Her. Him. <laughs> Well, it's an individual who has a psychopathic personality. And psychopathy is a personality disorder. But they're able to work within a business or an industry or an organization. They're very different than what we commonly think about a psychopath as the serial killer. These individuals have the same personality characteristics, but through education, through um, where they live, they are able to get jobs in big business and do fairly well for themselves. A psychopath is somebody who, as I've said before, is uh, without a conscience. Not because he doesn't have the intellectual uh, capacity to understand the difference between right and wrong. It's because the emotional connection with uh, cognitions, thoughts, and so forth is absent. Some of the characteristics would include this uh, stunning lack of empathy, uh, lack of concern for other people, uh, the ability to look at other people as mere objects. When normal people are processing emotional material, there is greater activation in parts of the brain that nature's designed to handle the emotionality. You can tell the difference between an emotional and a neutral event for these individuals, but for the psychopaths, you can't. It looks like parts of limbic uh, region, emotional brain, uh, hippocampus, amygdala, don't function the same in psychopaths as they do in other people. These are individuals who extremely, are extremely uh, egotistical, self-centered, uh, lacking remorse for what they have done, knowing exactly what they're doing, and what they're doing is manipulating and deceiving other people for their own ends. A lot of the psychopaths that I've known, and I've assessed over 160 of them, Um, a lot of the ones that I've known, they don't have an evil appearance or an e evil feel. They're they're out to con and manipulate you. So they're 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 charming. They're they're very charming, and um, and they come across as being extremely uh, easy to like. Most of them. What you see in the movie is the dark side of the personality. What you see when you actually interact with them is the mask that they're presenting with only a glimmer here and there of the dark side. And so if we learn from headlines and movies that psychopaths have this dark side and we go out looking for it, we're not gonna see it. And we'll conclude that they don't really exist. Or if they do, I've never met one. But you probably have met one, you just haven't seen behind the mask. fundamental mistake that most people make, and this includes not only the general public, but people like law enforcement officers who are trying to interrogate somebody, is the belief, the feeling, that everybody else thinks and feels the way we do. That uh, if, if, we have, if there's an emotional event, say, look at that, doesn't that just rip your heart out? And you uh, uh, expect everybody to get the same reaction, but the psychopath is looking at it, and for him, it, it's, not, it's a non-emotional event. When a psychopath is expressing emotion, is it the, the Stanislavski method of acting? Is he actually feeling it and he's able to project what's inside outside? And the answer is probably not. They're using facial expressions and hand movements, body language, that seems appropriate to an underlying emotional state, but is fake. I consulted on a movie uh, with Nicole Kidman called Malice. And she wanted me to go down to Hollywood to help her portray uh, what appeared to be a sweet, loving woman, uh, but who's really a psychopath. 
So anyway, she said, look, you've got to give me a scene. And I thought about it, and I don't know where it came from, but this is the scene I gave her. You have left your apartment, and you're walking down the street, and there's an accident. And then you look at the child who was on the floor, or on the ground, hit by the car, bleeding, probably dying. But kneeling beside the child is his mother. And she's emoting. She's going through every possible emotion that would be appropriate for that particular scene. And instead of watching the child and being horrified by the whole thing, you're kind of impassive, clinical, you watch the mother. And then you look at the child, back at the mother. And then you just walk away, unconcerned, walk back to your apartment, walk into the bathroom, stand in front of the mirror, and mimic the mother's expressions. That's it. <laughs> The psychopath has learned that there are certain facial expressions, uh, forms of body language that are associated with what other people say is a particular emotion. Okay, I get psychopath. What's a sociopath? One of the uh, better distinctions between a psychopath and a sociopath was made in the film uh, Reservoir Dogs. And Harvey Keitel says, you know, uh, we, I rob banks and if I have to kill three people, that's my jaw. I don't like it, but that's what I have to do. Psychopath ain't a professional. Can't work with a psychopath. That effing psychopath over there, the other individual, he likes to kill. You don't know what those sick assholes are going to do next. What we call the snake in suit, the white collar individual will get their needs met through more of the con manipulation or maybe the hardball attitude, right? Whereas the, and they may not resort to violence like some of the people that I've uh, dealt with that are incarcerated. But when I interview um, people with the psychopathy checklist, I will often take something out of my pocket and put it on the table. Um, and I'll say, this is the most important thing for you right now. This is what you want the most. And I'll put it on the table and the offender will be sitting over next to me and, and we're doing this assessment. And I'll say, now, how are you going to get that? And with the psychopath, typically I will see the person sit back and, and we call that duping delight. They look like, ah, this is a little game. We're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on this game. They're very competitive. They'll say, well, um, I'll try to, I'll ask you if I can have it. And I'll say, no, you can't have it. Well, I'll try to buy it off you and I'll pick it up at that point because I know they're going to grab it off the table if I don't. And I'll say, it's not for sale. And then I see that smirk again and it's like, I'll get it. Well, how, how would you get it? And most of the time I'm assessing them, so they're smart enough to not tell me how they would get it, but they just look at me and say, I'll get it. If we take 1% uh, as a working number for prevalence of psychopathy in the general population. We could always argue that this is such a small number, why even bother? Uh, the problem is that these people move around a lot. Uh, they're always looking for victims uh, and they find them. So they go to the watering holes, to the feeding grounds, they go where the action is. Uh, chances are that virtually everybody in our society is going to come across and be affected, influenced by one or two of these people in his or her lifetime doesn't sound like a big number until you think that that's one in a hundred people. In the average movie theater, when you go to see a movie, you're sitting in a room with one to two hundred people. So it's quite possible for you on any given day to bump into somebody who has a psychopathic personality. People would assume that because I've worked with this particular concept, psychopathy, for so long that I could spot them from uh, 100 paces. And the answer, of course, is that I can't. 
Uh, I'm no better at it than most people. You cannot determine to what extent somebody might be psychopathic simply by looking at them, even talking with this person for 5, 10, or 15, or 20 minutes. Sometimes it may even take six months or a year. And the problem is that we continue, uh, as a species, we're sort of programmed to do this, we continue to evaluate people the way they appear to us. We tend to be very forgiving in our interpersonal relationships with people. We're often open to their explanations and their rationalizations, and we give forgiveness. We also, when building a relationship with people, believe that they are real. What a psychopath does is they weave a picture of a person that's really a dream. It's a spirit. It's not real. And you feel like you've discovered a soulmate, a deep intimacy. And you're experiencing one of those rare fleeting moments that makes life worth living. And before you know it, you're involved in a deep personal bond with a psychopath. Once you're in that bond, we call it the psychopathic bond, you don't want to break it. And it often amazes the friends who are watching from outside. You're still with him, or you still believe what she said, or can't you see is very common. And they really can't see because of the strength of the bond that's been built. Now, when the psychopath is done with you, they leave. They've never had a bond with you. It's all been a game. And so they just stop playing and move on to the next target. You're left with all these open wounds because you thought you had a relationship with this person. And it could be a business relationship. It could be a business partner. It could be somebody who you're married to or a, a, a personal relationship. It could be a family member. And when it breaks, it hurts. And that's the psychological and emotional abuse that a psychopath, feeling no empathy, no remorse or no guilt, just moves on to the next target. It's the guy in the movie, um, <laughs> what is that movie? Where he's in the shower and he kills the lady. Horror movies about him. They kill people. <laughs> Insane. Murderer. Killing. A maniac. Criminal. Killer. Somebody like Charles Manson. For many years, it's been thought that the psychopath leads a terrible life, that they're not successful. The downward spiral was often mentioned in textbooks. But now we know it's quite different for many psychopaths. And maybe it's because they have greater access to education. Every psychopath that I've met has had a college degree and a couple have had PhDs. So there's greater education. There's the ability to look corporate to look like a business person as opposed to what one thinks of as a serial killer and somebody with a psychopath can put on the costume talk the language and have the certificate on the wall and easily convince somebody who owns an organization or is hiring for an organization that they are the ideal employee over the years, we've coined the term corporate psychopath to describe this particular individual. They share the same personality disorder, but we want to make them somewhat distinct so that people don't confuse the serial killer with the corporate psychopath. I think in the past, psychopaths flourished, but not nearly so much as they are right now, because the conditions have changed over the last 25 or 30 years. We had the introduction of the internet, for one thing. Uh, we had all, all this trading that can go on uh, at arm's length. You know, you can make a trade involving 100 million people at one time, rather than doing it face to face. We have the collapses in the financial world, starting in the United States and other parts of the world now. Uh, you say, well, it was economic conditions. Well, I'm not an economist, so I don't know what had happened. 
But like everybody else, when I read through this stuff, I say, hold up, there are a lot of decisions made by individuals along these lines, and who are these individuals? It would be very difficult to identify who they are because they blend in when you are talking about making a business decision, most businesses are risk averse, uh, or they want to manage the risk when they make a decision, whereas a psychopath will do something risky just to see what will happen. Making a decision that others would have taken a long time and a lot of data to come to, they'll do it on a whim. And because they are fearless, it could even hurt them, but it doesn't bother them. We mostly accept the view that our society is shaped like a pyramid, where a minority of the people at the top make decisions and laws for the majority at the bottom. In the year 2000, the richest and most powerful 1% of the world's population owned 40% of all global assets. The richest 10% accounted together for 85% of total assets. And in sharp contrast, the bottom half of the world's population divided between them barely 1% of global wealth. Now, it's not surprising when you remember the game of Monopoly. At the beginning, all the players start out as equals, and in the end, one person owns everything. Few people today know that the game was invented to demonstrate the strong tendency to concentrate wealth in the hands of a few. It goes to the inner roots of capitalism. With wealth comes power. You can't talk about psychopathy without bringing Bernie Madoff up. Now, I don't know whether he's a psychopath or not. Uh, I haven't evaluated him. I don't know of anybody who's done a formal evaluation on him. But anybody who can uh, destroy the lives of tens of thousands of people, including close relatives and friends, is not your normal loving kind of guy. In the spring of 2010, we heard back from Professor Hare. For the first time in history, his team was able to fish for psychopaths within the highest ranks of management at Fortune 100 companies, at the very top of the pyramid. We have a new study uh, looking at uh, corporate psychopathy. It's the first empirical study of this sort. Now, we had all sorts of anecdotes and we speculated and even in Snakes and Suits, we would talk about individual cases. It's unusual because, it, to my knowledge, it's the first study that was able to use a uh, well-validated measure of psychopathy with a lot of high-level executives. We have access to 203 uh, senior management uh, executives, people who were selected to go on to uh, further management training. They were considered fairly high-potential individuals. The results are actually rather fantastic. The distribution of uh, psychopathy scores in this uh, population of high-level executives is about what you expect in the general population. What differs for this group is that uh, there are more people with really high scores. And some of them, uh, I think eight or nine of the 203, had scores as high as the threshold that we use for research purposes uh, to diagnose psychopathy, that is 30 out of 40. And this was kind of surprising to us, and they had a lot more who had scores of 25 or higher. These are very high scores. Here we had people who had very high scores and psychopathic, very psychopathic, and yet were seen as good employees, a high potential executives, and whose performance was exceedingly bad, and yet they were still rising up to the top. We had several people who were vice presidents of their corporations. We had others who were directors and supervisors, high-ranking positions, and yet they had all the characteristics and qualities that should actually doom them to fail.
So what's it like to be a psychopath? You never have to feel guilty or ashamed again. Never. None of those sticky, uncomfortable situations. Responsibility? What's that? It's actually funny to watch when people cry. All you need is to smile at them, and they'll think that you're the nicest person in the world. You're so cold and analytical, and they don't even have a clue. They can never guess what's going on inside your head. You can do anything you want. What happens in an organization is that the psychopath can mimic the high potential employee. And so they hide amongst this group of individuals. And high performers in organizations tend to get more resources, they get more training, they get bigger projects, bigger budgets, more staff, all the trappings of corporate power, which is exactly what the psychopath, who's a parasitic predator, is looking for. And it is unfortunate for the organization on the whole that the psychopath can do this. What happens in that small group is that the psychopath realizes that all of the other high potentials are rivals or potential rivals and begins to take them out through manipulation, lying, backbiting, all of those kinds of behind the scenes activity. The organization then begins to lose this cadre of high potential performers. They either leave of their own volition or they're set up and they're fired or they're sent to uh, another division where they're you know, out of the way, and then the psychopath has taken control. So yes, they do have an advantage because of their personality, and it really is up to the organization to set up some control mechanisms, some monitoring mechanisms to be able to differentiate the true high performer from those who only look like that. You could probably see it on, in, at the world level, you're thinking of governments, government leaders, and I see no reason why somebody who is very, very psychopathic couldn't end up as a leader. We've had this many times in history. And you can go right back to the Romans and the Greeks and the Egyptians and just trace them all the way through, and many of these people clearly would qualify as psychopaths. But given the, the times and the context, uh, they did fairly well. Now, a lot of people suffered because of it. And I think what's happening right now is that uh, if we value what these people are doing, or maybe to put it another way, we don't actually pay attention to the bad things that they're doing. You know, we look at, this is terrific, the guy's he's doing this, and making lots of money for us, and our popularity around the world is increasing, we're moving our armies around, and we're getting all this prestige and so forth, but people are suffering. Okay, so, what you already subconsciously knew has been proven. That the world, to some degree or another, is run by psychopaths. So what do we do with that? We go after them? We take them down? How? And is that really the problem? Are they the fish head? Given a choice, you might want to be one. I mean, or at least a sociopath. Now, it turns out there's a really easy way to do that. And millions of people around the world have already taken a bold step in that direction. The connection may not be clear at first, but it will reveal itself. I was at a funeral of my mother and really beloved woman. And I have a relative passing around Valium. I said, what is this? They said, oh, uh, it's okay. It'll make you not be nervous or, or depressed. I said, I'm grieving. I want to be nervous. I want to be depressed. It's my mother's dead. 
if, you know, what is the whole point? They said, well, no, but you, you know, don't you want to just be calm? I said, no, you're missing the whole point. The point of, of the reason you're at a funeral is not only to show respect to the dead, but to grieve, you know, to, to indicate to yourself how much you miss this person. And they couldn't even understand that message because their whole orientation has been so undercut, so brainwashed, if you will, by, by the pharmaceutical messages, whatever, whenever there's a problem, there's a drug for it. It's a drug. Which uh, makes you feel happy. Antidepressants, sure, yes. Yes, I have heard of antidepressants. Yeah, I know what they are. But I don't know anybody. It's a medication. Yes, medication. Yeah. 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 I honestly don't know. No. I heard about them. That sounds really That's familiar. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, uh, Prozac, no. Xanax, yes. Uh, Do you have any? A little more than 67 and a half million North Americans have taken a course of SSRI antidepressants, which is a phenomenal situation. I do not have any personal experience, now. None? I'm a very happy person. <laughs> Are you? No. I'm a happy person. No personal experience. Not personal. No personal knowledge. No. 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 Personally, no. But I know people who have had experience with those type of things. People have been demanding the medical industry make them feel better for centuries. The first drug, which was probably demand-driven, was um, probably drugs like Valium. If you take it under the right circumstances and in the right dosages, you're going to feel better in, in the traditional sense. You know, you're going to get a buzz. Uh, and it was those drugs that really, I mean, before the antidepressants were the blockbuster drugs. Huge numbers of these drugs were prescribed. Valium cut through to the masses. It's an anti-anxiety agent and a very effective anti-anxiety agent. with a lot of side effects and it's very addictive. In the beginning, a little bit like Prozac, they thought that it didn't have many side effects. In 1987, when Prozac was approved for the market, uh, it was promoted very heavily, but it became a blockbuster drug, um, in large part because the media just set off a phenomenon, uh, the Prozac effect. Uh, it was on the cover of Newsweek in the early 90s. There was a very famous book called Listening to Prozac. Sales hit $1 billion, then $2 billion. A billion dollars in sales represents what they call a blockbuster drug. Another critical moment that sort of brought it uh, to the level that it's at now uh, was the television marketing of drugs. Television ads for drugs were illegal in the United States until the late 90s, and um, that brought Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft into people's living rooms sort of on a nightly basis. Everybody with a sort of passing anxiety or depression or uh, seasonal affective disorder um, can be potentially medicated or potentially diagnosed. You know, sibling relational problem, which is, you know, duh, you know, having problems with your brother or sister. Uh, and to me, that's not psychiatry, that's not dealing with mental illness. The concentration on schizophrenia, on major depression, on bipolar disorder has been to a large degree diverted to the, the everyday anxieties, but we've diagnosed them and medicated them in extraordinary fashion. I don't know anybody that's depressed, but I do know that the people that do take them, they work for them. If they don't take them, they go back crazy. That's just about all I know. Well, it's just a mess being on antidepressants. They create as many issues as they solve. Oh, my father, he's another one. My father was on Prozac. 
for a while. One of the ways that, that Prozac became so popular and the way the drug was marketed was that um, it would allow you to function better and to be more effective in a, a competitive society and sort of mast, you know, attempt to master those fears. For mild depression or the appearance of mild depression and the medication of that condition, uh, the stigma is so far reduced that it's actually kind of cool, you know, to be depressed, to be fucked up and messed up and stressed out and concomitantly to be taking drugs for that. There is a consequence. These are serious drugs. And you see it on college campuses where it's become so little of a big deal that it's almost dangerous. In addition to the recognized problem of uh, increased obsession with suicide, um, a litany of further side effects that actually when you, when you compare those with the fact that people sometimes have been prescribed a drug because they're afraid of going to parties. The whole thing just becomes so, so surreal. How do you say, okay, I, I'm, I'm prepared to risk renal failure because I'm a little shy when I go to a party. I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely absurd. I get it, I get it. People are taking these drugs which have a dubious effect and they're taking them when they don't really have anything wrong with them. Why do I care? The drugs that we take for depression now, the uh, SSRIs, largely work by uh, changing the metabolism of serotonin in the brain. One of the things that these drugs do seem to do pretty consistently when they're working is they, they sort of curtail or attenuate emotional life. So many people describe um, how they're in situations when they've been on the drugs for a while where they know they should be getting angry or they know they should be sad and they sort of are sad but they're not feeling what they would expect to feel. I've written about how the drugs generally for some people sort of numb them out you know and many people have written about how you know our normal affect which is mood will go up and down and many many people have written about how that that range becomes much more the the highs get get topped off and the lows get bottomed out with with Prozac and, and similar drugs and I've seen you know definitely a um, a narrowing of that emotional range and a, an associated indifference to the larger world I think that it's possible to say that without that access, without the access to those depths of feeling, it's very difficult to develop empathy of the kind that really affects behavior. I mean, if you look at the global economic meltdown, whatever we're gonna call this time that we're living in right now, anybody reading the New York Times or listening to the nightly news knew that there was a bubble, whether it was the high-tech bubble or the housing bubble. They knew it was happening in broad daylight. So what allows people to stand back and watch that happen? It's interesting to see this. And then if you add to that the fact that the particular nature of these bubbles is that it's all form and no content. It's all ambition. It's unbridled uh, speculation. And it's fueled by what? By confidence. If you go and you look at what people experience when they take these drugs, what they experience when they take these drugs is an upsurge in feelings of well-being, confidence, uh, resilience, the ability to sort of take what comes and not let it lay you low. And I think that it's possible to assemble a picture where it at least bears investigation what these two phenomena have to do with each other. The 
fact that um, so many people have, in, in, in the financial markets have been taking antidepressants is a cause for worry. When those people are not um, receiving enough feedback, gut level feedback on the consequences of their decision. Speaking personally, because I've taken the drugs, um, fear seemed farther away. It seemed like coming from a different place. What I described is something that bothered me before the drugs, before Prozac, uh, that felt like a steak knife, if it was on my cheek, felt like a butter knife. And so the sharper things in the world went from steak knives to butter knives. The issue of emotional blunting that is widely known to be a side effect from SSRI antidepressants becomes very worrying in those contexts because those people need to feel a certain amount of feedback, as it were, perceptually with their actions. It's one thing to know it cognitively, in theory. It's another to feel it viscerally. I am trading billions of dollars with this transaction. Is it wise? Is it cautious? Have I correctly interpreted everything? And the body, the, the, the mind, needs that kind of feedback. You know, if you think about simple things that are supposed to underlie Western civilization, the categorical imperative, uh, the golden rule, these ideas that somehow, because of your regard for other people, you must behave in a certain way, even if it's not a law, even if nobody told you to, but simply because you can resonate with that other person, uh, I think we need access to our full range of emotional experience in order to do that. So it's still a, pretty, a leap from saying that to saying that the drug amplifies or uh, even causes sociopathy. But it's a very suggestive link because I, I just don't know what else is going to guarantee that we don't just cream each other all the time. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck. Fucking fucking. Fucking fucking. Fucking fuck. Fuck. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. It's tempting to want to stop here and say that the problem, the ultimate fish head is psychopaths and people taking happy pills to deal with psychopathic conditions. But that's sidestepping the main issue which is why are we, the rest of us, not doing anything about it? So what's the connection between psychopaths and happy pills? Empathy. Simple human empathy, or the lack of it. Psychopaths don't have it, and happy pills kill it. For me, what's interesting is I wrote a book called The Lucifer Effect, and the Lucifer story is identical to the Adam and Eve story. And they're both stories about the horrific consequences of disobeying authority, God. You could be God's favorite angel and become the devil. You could be God's favorite human and be cast out as a traitor, as an infidel. And so that message, which has really deeply impacted, certainly in Western uh, civilization, leads us to be blindly obedient to authority. So the, f the famous research by my colleague Stanley Milgram shows that at least two-thirds of all people, of all ordinary citizens, when told by somebody who seems like an authority to physically punish someone else, 
They blindly obey. So going back to the famous study by Stanley Milgram in which he gets a thousand ordinary citizens from two towns in, in Connecticut to believe that they are teachers trying to help a learner learn by punishing errors, but the learner who is actually a confederate of the experimenter and the teacher doesn't know, keeps making more and more errors and the teacher keeps shocking him more and more and more on this big shock box until there's a point at which he stops responding, he's probably unconscious, and instead of quitting, the experiment says you must continue to the very end, which is 450 volts. Two-thirds of all ordinary Americans went to the end, two-thirds. But in, in the many experiments he did, he did two that are, have been ignored. In one, you come in ready to help, to be a teacher, and when you sit down, you observe somebody from the previous experiment going all the way. In another study, you come in and you observe two people refusing. So they are two social models of evil and good. And you know what happens? If the base rate is 60% who blindly obey, when you see somebody go all the way, it becomes a negative model for you and 91% of all the population in those studies go all the way. But if you see people rebel, 90% refuse to go on. And so this is something we have to deal with. Why is it that it's so important for most societies for people to blindly obey authority? To blindly obey authority means be mindless, don't be mindful, don't do critical thinking, just do what you're told. And that then links up. If parents say, mind your own business, don't get involved, you know, don't think too deeply about it, just do what I say. That is one of the worst things that could happen in any society. An unthinking society is a society that's vulnerable to the psychopaths because they say, I have the answer, I have the way, I have the money, I have the power, I have the status, I can give you jobs. All you have to do is do it my way. Long before the corporate psychopaths, there was Hitler and Stalin and, and, and the others, you know. Um, and, and those totalitarian dictators had the same message. Give me your power and I will give you security or the illusion of security. And all you have to do is do what I tell you to do. Many people are willing to give up freedom because it has associated responsibility for the illusion of security. For somebody to say, okay, you're a good boy. You're a good child. Now, now go play in the corner and don't bother the grown-ups. And so in that sense, it's a prolongation of immaturity. That is, as children, authorities, most parents most teachers are good. Following their lead is good. But nobody teaches us to make the distinction between just authority that deserves our respect and unjust authority that deserves defiance. And that's a big problem because as you grow older, then here are these psychopaths, political, religious, organizational, industrial, who put on the same mask and say, follow me. And you say, okay without thinking why, where, when, and how. Well, I think the first thing I'd say to people is, is pay attention to your gut. Uh, I think a lot of people ignore the gut feeling the instinct and you've got instinct then you should pay attention to it i think you know human beings uh, are the maybe the only um animal species that will uh, ignore that that gut instinct <laughs> the problem isn't that that our leaders or our corporate managers are sociopaths, so some of them are. Uh, nor is it that the world is run by dark, shadowy figures that are malignant in their intention. I know these people, they're not that.
but the organizations themselves and the systems are sociopathic. You can't expect them to have a conscience. You can't expect them to have a heart. You have to live within their nature. You can't regard nature itself as being evil. Nature doesn't have a valence. What does have a valence is the human heart and what it can express itself around through widening the circle of empathy. Why should I care more about empathy than the next guy? None of the rich guys made it big through empathy. Why should I give up my comfort and my aspirations? We all want to win, don't we? What I see over and over again is the, the collision, if you will, in, in the organizational systems, that you have somebody at the very top of the organization, and you know I work with a, a number of these people, and they're all making um, what I think most any of us would consider just extreme amounts of money. And if you think about the effect of this on psychologically on the people, it becomes a situation where money and the desire for money simply begets more desire. And I think that's a very primitive, uh, from what we understand about human psychology, that's a very primitive state of desire and appetite to see it as, as limitless and be able to almost devour anything. Uh, and usually in our own process of maturation, we have the experience of encountering limits, right? And we learn about reality testing and, well, I might want that or feel I could take all of that, but in fact, I understand my limits. And I think there is something certainly that goes on psychologically where those limits become removed. These are crazy times, and, and people are crazy within them, and institutions are crazy within them, and, and this is how it will be as we try to adjust to the idea that, that everything we know is wrong. But I think there are some things we can do to make them better, and one of them is to give up on the, the pursuit of happiness in the sense that happiness is something you get from more. Consumer culture rests on dissatisfaction. When we long for something, our notion of that is that unless we can get it, we're never going to be happy. And in the consumer society, the fact that you can't get it means there's something wrong with you. For me, one of the problems is when you talk about good and evil, villains and heroes, it's really a sharp distinction. But really, there's a gray line between them that no one who does evil ever thinks what they're doing is evil. Evil, there's a slippery slope that we know evil begins with a small first step, signing a petition. In the Milgram experiments, is pressing a 15-volt switch that the person hardly feels. Uh, it's telling, telling a racist joke, which doesn't seem so bad. But once you do that, once you cross the line between good and evil, then it becomes easier and easier to take the next step, the next step, the next step, until finally what you're doing is now uh, irrefutably evil. great heroes of this century is the former president of Czech Republic, Václav Havel, who was a playwright. And he's faced with the terrible repression of the communist regime. And as a playwright, instead of going about his business writing plays, he now opposes. He said, this is wrong. And he gets put in jail. And from jail, he sends letters saying, this is wrong. This is wrong, a wrong way for the Czech people to live. And ultimately, he was able to persuade millions of people to change their passivity.
každý z nás zná takový podivný pocit ušpiněnosti, zapatlanosti. Pocit, který se nazývá výčitka svědomí. Když uděláme nějaký kompromis, o němž si nejsme jistě, jestli byl dobrý, tak na něj myslíme znovu a znovu a trošku se vlastně trápíme. I když ten kompromis nám možná usnadnil život ve srovnání se situací, která by nastala, kdybychom ho neučinili. Ale já osobně u sebe hm, eh, pozoruji to, že hm, když se zachovám statečně, je to vlastně ze zbavělosti, protože se bojím, že se dostaví ten pocit té zalepkanosti, že jsem něco udělal špatně, že jsem udělal nežádoucí kompromis, že jsem uhnul a naopak, když něco udělám, u čeho vím, že, že jsem to udělal správně, tak mám až takový pocit lehké euforie. Před letošním 21. srpnem jsem řekl, že ještě nenastal okamžik, kdy jde o vše a je třeba vložit do hry celé své srdce. Mám pocit, že takový okamžik nadešel dnes. The reason that most people do nothing is that they respect Every mother in the world who tells their child, mind your own business, don't get involved. People get programmed not to look at evil, to mind their own business, not to get involved, not to take the heroic action. And essentially what it is, we're also being programmed to be egocentric. Here it is. We're being told that one way or another, we're all part of the fish head. <sighs> well, even if we accept that, I mean, what is there to do? It's so big, there's nothing we can do. And if we're all going down, we might as well take a few pleasures along the way. Or can we maybe turn it around? Is there hope? Maybe. And maybe the hope is the same as the reason that we're in this mess together. Because we are in it together. Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler are not the only people to research humans and their behavior, but their work shows some surprising facts about how much we're influenced by people around us, and more importantly, how we influence people around us, even complete strangers. Or what I think is somewhat novel about the work that we've done is not that we've shown that people are affected by those around them. This is common sense, right? We know this. We know that human beings are affected by others. But what we've been able to show, I think, is that we're affected not just by people who are one degree removed from us, but also by people who are two and even three degrees removed from us. Not only is it the case that our friends seem to affect us, but our friends' friends also seem to affect us. In fact, this spreads to our friends' friends' friends at three degrees of separation. The point is, is that it's not just one degree, it's more than one degree. Uh, the point is, is that we don't just affect those around us, but we affect other people who are strangers to us. And that we are not just affected by those around us, but affected by other people who are strangers to us. And we find that this is true for obesity, for smoking, for happiness, for loneliness, for drinking behavior, for depression. Everywhere we look, we find this three degrees of separation. Um, it, you tend to affect your friends, 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 and no further. 
and your friends' friends' friends tend to affect you and, and no further. The human beings are assembled into these elaborate, complex, branching, lightning-like structures. Uh, where I'm connected to you and you to others and those others each to others and you get this incredibly baroque, intricate, beautiful pattern of human social networks. And most people when they hear social networks nowadays they think about the online variety which is a very recent phenomenon, you know, the last five or ten years we've been assembling ourselves into this online networks, into these online networks, but in reality human beings have been assembling themselves into social networks for hundreds of thousands of years. Even though the results of their study have been verified, there are still those who remain unconvinced. Especially in, in countries like the United States, where individualism is so strong, I think a lot of people think that they're the captain of their own ship, that they're making these decisions independently. Um, and I think what our research really shows is that, that we don't make these decisions in isolation. We do make the decisions, but we're strongly influenced by the people that we're surrounded by. And it doesn't end there. It's not like, like our friends are operating under some different physical rules. Um, they operate under the same rules that we are, and they're connected to people that we're not. And so it, it makes sense that, that we would all be connected in this way. You know, it's, it's like a, a herd of buffalo. If, if you're in the middle of that herd of buffalo, and, and the buffaloes on the edge start turning to the left, that's eventually going to reach its way to you, and you're going to be turning to the left with the rest of the herd as well. A lot of people looking at the work that James and I have been publishing over the last years have said that in some sense our work delivers a whack to free will. That what our work shows is that people are not as incapable of independent decision making as they thought. In fact, even things so deeply personal as, as your emotional state or who you vote for or what your body size is would appear to be influenced to a significant extent by those around you, even people you don't know. And that in some sense, therefore, we're not capable of as much free will as we thought. And that we are not as free to make choices as we thought, that we are influenced by others. And that's true. But it's also true that our work actually supports the importance and lifts up free will. I believe that behavior is changed by having a social norm which says this is the way we behave, this is the way it's acceptable, this is the way it's appropriate to behave. One of the fundamentally interesting things about human social networks is that networks tend to magnify whatever they are seated with. So they will magnify germs, they will magnify fascism, they will magnify um, smoking, drug use. Twenty years ago, if I was in a room with 10 people smoking and I was the guest of honor, I would have to leave the room when my, my eyes teared up. And, and when, I, when I wiped the tears away, I came, came back and I said, okay, now we can go on with the meeting. The social norm was smoking is okay. Now, if one person lights up, that person has to leave the room. Or now, in many, certainly in America, and certainly in, in West Coast, nobody lights up in, in, a, in public. So social norms are critical. So how do we change the norm away from me first to us first. So by promoting the notion of ordinary heroes, everyday heroes, we give the world a new social norm to say, your task in the world is not to seek power for yourself, it's to seek power for other people. What our generosity study shows is that if the good things that we do tend to ripple out so that the people around us copy those good things and the people around them copy those good things, it's also possible that some of those paths loop back to us. If you're exposed to people who treat you kindly and cooperate with you, then when the bell rings and you interact with new people who are strangers to you, you treat them kindly. And then when the bell rings and those people interact with still other new people, they treat those people kindly. So the way I am treated now ripples through the network and can affect complete strangers. So I absolutely believe that when you learn that you influence not just your friends, but your friends' friends and your friends' friends' friends, that it changes the way you see the world. When we looked at how happiness spread from person to person to person, and when we saw that it spread three degrees of separation, 
I started making a concerted effort to change my mood when I walked down the street and came home. James gives the example, which I agree with, uh, that you know, on your way home from work, if you make the effort to regulate your mood to the extent that you can. I would put on my favorite song, even if I was in kind of a bad mood, to try and just give myself a temporary boost so that when I walked in the door that I could make myself happier and therefore make my family happier and everyone in their lives happier. If you see that, you know, Betty is kind to Jane and Jane is kind to Sue and Sue is kind to Robert, you can see uh, the signature of Betty's kindness to Jane in Sue's behavior with Robert even though Sue and Robert never interacted with Betty. Well, this is all very nice, but, uh, I mean, how do we know that doing something for others is worth the effort? Unless we're sure that it's going to pay off, we're probably not going to do it. I mean, we can cut our smoking, but does that mean that we can turn the world around? Do you think that being moral actually pays off? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Uh, definitely. Uh, definitely. Depending on the situation. It's as contagious as anything that would be bad, too. So I think the more we all do that, the more we spread it around. Everybody has the power to do so. It starts on me and passes it on to others. The reason why morality pays off is because we have an influence on the decisions of people around us. When they copy our moral behavior, then this is going to spread through the network and it also will have this tendency to ripple out and bounce back towards us. We surround ourselves with people who are doing good by doing good ourselves. And when we live in that kind of an environment, I can't help but think that, that this is the way that we succeed, that we survive, that we reproduce these ideas and we create a better future for ourselves. Já mám na to takové přirovnání našeho, našeho příběhu, českého příběhu, kdy ta opozice, ti disidenti takzvaní, byli všemi považováni za blázny, protože se to zítra nebo pozítří nezmění v nějaký konkrétní úspěch, to je jejich počínání. A ono se posléze v jakýsi úspěch změnilo. Že, ale nebylo to proto, že jsme kalkulovali s tím, že zítra nebo pozítří se to stane, i když bychom to uvítali, ale prostě proto, že jsme to dělali z principu. Is it important to be moral? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Of course. Well. <laughs> Proč vlastně člověk páchá občas dobro, když o tom nikdo neví? No to je možné, Jenom proto, že ve vás dříme být nevědomně jakýsi pozorovatel, který to všechno, co děláte, vidí. No a co to je jiného než věčnost, než nekonečno? Něco, co přesahuje, přesahuje všechny myslitelné horizonty našeho počínání. Do you feel motivated, energized to do something? Maybe it's the piano music. If I could remind you a few moments ago, you briefly considered being a psychopath. It's okay. It's a surprising function of our brains that we can hold radically opposite views simultaneously. It's a natural part of our makeup. In times like these where there is this madness, it becomes really important to remember that what basically is going on in the world is how you are with the people immediately at hand and how you treat yourself and, the, and your children and the people directly around you. And yeah, there will be winds and weather and economic uh, storms and, and social storms and, and, and political catastrophes and, and much that is incomprehensible, but, but what goes on you know, eye to eye, face to face, heart to heart, day to day, remains the same. Všechno začíná u drobných věcí. Nemusí člověk vymýšlet vize lepšího světa. Stačí, když se v tom prostoru, v 
v němž se pohybuje, když se začne chovat slušněji, v souladu se svým svědomím, nikoli tak, aby měl onen nepříjemný pocit upatlanosti. Že? A stačí, když to dělá v tom svém mikrosvětě. A ono to může se šířit, rozrůstat jako epidemie a také nemusí je zůstane to navždy v tom jeho mikrosvětě. Ale stojí to vždycky za to. If I was always violent towards you, or gave you deadly germs, or made you sad, or gave you misinformation, you would cut the ties to me and the network would disintegrate. Therefore, the spread of some good and desirable properties, like altruism and love and happiness and ideas, is required to sustain and nurture the network. And similarly, the network is required for these desirable things to happen. So there's a very deep connection, we think, between social networks and goodness. And actually, we think that in a very deep level, human beings assemble themselves into networks because the benefits of a connected life outweigh the costs. I've been studying the human condition for more than 40 years, focusing primarily on what makes ordinary people turn, get seduced into evil. But now I realize and I'm aware that most people, most ordinary people are really basically good, but they're good and passive. They're really not going to get seduced to evil, but they're not going to be willing to put in the energy to be a hero. And what we're trying to do is create a social movement in which we want to give voice to the silent heroes out there. Because there are many people who have the potential to be really important heroes, not only for their family, for their neighborhood, for the community, but for the nation. And so, in the audience, out there, there are many Baklav Havels who are living in environments where there is injustice, where there, there are drug cartels, uh, where there is corruption of various kind, where there's bullying in almost every classroom. And it's our job to help amplify your silent voice. And it's your job to be willing to step across the line to take action, to say, this is wrong. So imagine that the most charismatic, handsome person looks you directly in the eye and says, you can save the world. What would you do? We can deal with the fish head if we remember that we're in this together. And we stop looking at the top of the pyramid where the celebrities and the leaders are, and we look side to side. The advantage of being in a herd is that when as few as five to six percent of the total population becomes aware of something, like danger, for instance, nearly everyone becomes aware. And our success is going to depend on the answer to two questions. How many are we? How close are we to the five to six percent? And what will you do? Thank you.